Good morning. And I'd like to start by thanking you very much for inviting me to speak at your conference. So my title is Some Evidence for Physicalism About Sensations. And I will be arguing this morning that we do have some evidence for physicalism about sensations. And my paper falls into three sections. So as you should be able to see on the screen, the first section uh, aims to clarify the key terms in the title. Um, the second section presents what I take to be the evidence, the some evidence anyway, the evidence I have in mind for physicalism about sensations. And then the third section tries to explain uh, with a little care what makes it the case that this evidence is evidence for, uh, for physicalism. Um, so I want to start with the term sensations. So sensations are a kind of mental state um, that we're in, or you may think of sensations as events that we undergo. We talk about having sensations. I think that's the same sort of talk um, that we engage in as when we say that we, we had an accident. If I fall over, I can say that I had a fall. I think having a fall and having a, having a sensation, like having a pain, um, are similar in both cases. They're states or events that I'm a participant um, in. Traditionally, um, a distinction is drawn between two kinds of sensation, uh, perceptual sensations on the one hand and bodily sensations on the other. And I have a, um, some examples, a list of some examples of uh, perceptual sensations here. So um, uh, vi visual sensations of color or shape or motion or number, auditory sensations, olfactory sensations, tactile sensations, gustatory sensations, and then hallucinations corresponding to these um, different sense modalities, visual afterimages of the sort you might have having looked at a bright light, for example, are, uh, are, are also perceptual sensations. Seeing stars before your eyes if you stand up too quickly after you've been sitting for a long time. Um, ringing, ringing in the ears that you might have if you um, go to a loud concert or whatever. Um, those are perceptual sensations. There are also uh, bodily um, sensations. Um, so I have examples of, of those. Um, being in pain, um, which is actually what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, having an itch, feeling nausea, as if you're about to throw up, feeling on edge or tense, feeling thirsty or hungry, feeling dizzy, feeling euphoric, having butterflies in the stomach. These are all examples of uh, bodily um, sensations. So I say today I'm just going to talk about one kind of bodily sensation, namely pain, um, in part because pain has often been an example of a sensation that has been thought to be problematic um, for physicalism. But if what I say about pains is correct, then it's at least um, likely that similar things will be true of other kinds of bodily sensations and probably other kinds of um, perceptual sensations as well. So let me turn now to physicalism, another word in my title. Um, so here's what I mean by physicalism about sensations. Um, it's the thesis that uh, all sensations are physical, but that thesis is then spelled out in the, in the following way. Every sensation, for example, pain, dizziness, euphoria, is either identical with one and the same thing as some or other physical state, or it's identical with one and the same thing as some or other higher order state that is in fact always realized by um, a physical state. Um, for, for current purposes, for our purposes now, it's enough to think of uh, a physical state as more or less a neurophysiological state. 
a state of the kind posited by the neurosciences as we currently have the neurosciences. So physical states for our purposes today uh, are going to be states constituted by uh, kinds of electrochemical activity in neurons and in uh, networks of, of neurons. Um, so to be physical, um, pain has either to be a physical state or, as I say here, to be um, some or other higher order state. And by a higher order um, state, I mean a state of being in some or other lower order state that meets a certain condition. For example, it plays a certain causal role, um, or perhaps it has a certain uh, teleological bio function. Um, so, for example, if, if pain is a higher order state, which I think is more likely than that it's a physical state, um, then perhaps something like the following is true, um, that pain is the state of being in any state S that is the activation of a subsystem whose biofunction is first to detect actual or imminent bodily damage and second to produce an appropriate behavioral um, response. So a creature can be in pain so long as it contains a subsystem which has um, these two biofunctions and then the creature is in pain so long as it's in a state that constitutes the activation of um, that uh, subsystem. Um, if pain is realized by a physical state, which it needs to be if pain is a higher order state and physicalism is true, then um, S has to be a physical state. So if pain is physically realized, um, there's going to be a physical state um, that is the activation of a subsystem with these two bio, uh, bio functions. Um, I won't talk, I won't use the phrase physicalism about sensations over and over. To save breath, I'll just say a physicalism, but understand me to mean um, physicalism about uh, sensations. Um, the third word, uh, a phrase in my title is some evidence. So let me um, let me turn to that. Um, by evidence, I mean something that raises the prob probability of a hypothesis. Um, so E is some evidence for hypothesis H, if and only if the probability of H given E is greater than the prior probability of of H. Um, let me just remind you of a couple of uh, elementary points about evidence so understood. Um, the, the, the first point is that um, although e evidence necessarily raises the probability of a hypothesis, it doesn't necessarily raise that probability by very much. It could raise it by a very small amount. Um, it might take that probability from 0.2 to 0.25. Um, for instance. So to claim that there's some evidence for a hypothesis is not to claim that the hypothesis is probable on that evidence. It's not to claim that it has a probability of more than 0.5. S still less is it to claim that the probability is high. Okay? Um, the, the second um, elementary point about evidence is that even if some evidence raises the probability of a hypothesis. Even if it raises it a lot, it may also be true that there's other evidence that lowers the probability of the hypothesis. And it may lower the probability of the hypothesis by more than the first evidence raised the, pro the probability of the hypothesis. So that nothing follows about the probability of the hypothesis on total evidence, on all the evidence that we currently have. Of course, in the end, one is interested usually in the, um, the, the probability of a hypothesis on, on total evidence. Now, I, I mention these points um, about evidence in order to emphasize um, how very modest 
are the claims that I'll be making um, today. So, um, more precisely, um, these are the claims that I'll be making. So the first claim is that some evidence raises the probability of physicalism, i.e., uh, for some E, the probability of physicalism given E is greater than the prior probability of physicalism. And then the second claim um, I'll make is that the probability of physicalism on this evidence is higher than the probability of dualism on this evidence, i.e., the probability of physicalism given E is greater than the probability of dualism um, given E. Um, what's modest about these claims is that even if the first claim is true, that we have some evidence that raises the probability of physicalism, um, nothing follows about the probability of physicalism on total evidence. And even if claim two is true, um, it doesn't follow that physicalism is more probable than dualism on total evidence, just that it's more probable than physicalism on the evidence that I'll present. So if you think, for example, that parapsychology provides evidence um, against physicalism, that's fully consistent with what I have to say um, today. And even if you think that this parapsychological evidence is... Um, so strong that dualism is more probable than physicalism on total evidence, that's still consistent um, with, my, with my second claim, that the probability of physicalism on the evidence I'm going to be drawing attention to is, is uh, higher than the probability of dualism on that, um, on that evidence. Similarly, you know, if, if you think that one of the standard philosophical arguments against uh, physicalism about sensations is correct. You, you think Jackson's, Frank Jackson's knowledge argument is correct, for instance, or you think that David Chalmers' zombie argument is, is correct. That's also consistent um, with both of, of my claims. Um, un unless you think that what these arguments show is that the probability of physicalism is zero. If the probability of physicalism is zero, then no evidence can um, raise its probability um, at all. Um, but I don't think many people think that even if these arguments, these philosophical arguments are good ones, that they have the effect of showing that the probability of, uh, of, of physicalism is zero. Um, so I'm not, I'm not making any claim today about the probability of physicalism on um, total evidence, just on the evidence that I'm going to point to. So let me um, move to, to section two now. Um, the, evident, the alleged um, evidence. Um, the evidence for physicalism that I want to draw attention to is a form of what Paul Churchland um, called um, the neural dependence of the mental. The fact that the mental depends on um, the neural in um, ways that we have um, have observed. Um, more specifically, the the aspect of pain that people think can't possibly be physical or physically realised is pain's phenomenal character. What it's like to be in pain. Um, the, the phenomenal character of a sensation is the totality of those features of the sensation um, that we're aware of from the inside, so to speak. So um, we can, of course, be very confident that somebody else is in pain when they are in pain. Um, it can pain us to see someone else in pain. We're that sure that the other person is in pain. Um, but as much as we might know about the pain behavior of the person who's in pain, as much as we might know about the brain state of the person who's in pain, we think that there's something that the person who is in pain knows about the pain from the inside through introspection. Okay? That's the phenomenal character of pain. And that's what people think 
can't possibly be physical or, or, or physically realized. Now, what I'm claiming is evidence for physicalism about pain is the dependence of the phenomenal character of pain on neural properties of the brain. So precisely this um, supposedly problematic feature of pain, its phenomenal character, that's the thing that I say is um, dependent on neural properties of the brain, and that dependence of the phenomenal on the neural um, is, is, the, is the evidence for physicalism um, about um, pain. So that's what I've just um, said. Let me make a couple of comments about this, um, about what this dependence is not, and then I will say in more detail what it is and why I think that there, this dependence exists. Um, th th this dependence of the phenomenal character of pain on the neural properties of our pains, it's not a general dependence. So it, it's not like the dependence of the phenomenal character of pain on the functioning of our hearts. It's true that the phenomenal character of our pains does depend on the functioning of our hearts. Right? So if your heart stops beating, you don't, you, you don't feel anything, so you don't feel any pains. Um, but the dependence of the phenomenal character of pain on neural properties of the brains of our brains that I have in mind is highly specific, highly spe specific features of the phenomenal character of pain depend on highly specific neural um, properties. So it, it, the dependence I have in mind is it's, it's not even a general dependence of pain on the functioning of our brains. I mean, it's true that if our brains cease to function, then we don't feel any pain. That's not what's true um, and not unimportant, but that's not the dependence that I have in mind, the dependence I have in mind is much more detailed and, and, and specific. Something else that the dependence that I have in mind is not, is it's not the holding of biconditional correlations between specific features of pain and specific neural properties. It's a weaker dependence um, than that. So let me, let me say now, let me turn from saying what it isn't to what it is. Um, as it says on the, on the screen, it's, it's what I call empirical supervenience. The empirical supervenience of um, the phenomenal character of pain on neural properties of our brains. And here's the thesis stated a little bit more carefully. As a matter of fact, um, no sort of change or variation in the phenomenal character of pains ever occurs without a certain sort of simultaneous change or variation in neural state. So there's no change or variation in the phenomenal character of your pain without there being a certain sort of simultaneous change in um, the neural state that you're in, the neural properties that your brain, um, brain has. Um, now, it's worth pointing out um, that empirical, this phenomenon of empirical supervenience does not by itself presuppose physicalism about pain. It's consistent with the falsity of physicalism about pain. As we'll see, a dualist can accept imp the empirical supervenience of the phenomenal character of pain on neural properties of our brains. Um, th th there are people who um, think, or there have been people who think to formulate physicalism in terms of claims of supervenience. Um, but the supervenience claims that some people have th thought are sufficient for physicalism are modal um, supervenience claims. So their claims to the effect that there cannot be, not just that there is not, but that there cannot be variation in mental properties without variation in physical properties. Um, 
That's not what empirical supervenience um, is. It's just the claim that, as a matter of fact, it, it doesn't happen that there's any sort of change or variation in the phenomenal character of um, our pains without there being a certain sort of simultaneous change or variation in the, pheno uh, in the neural properties that our, our uh, brains have. So empirical supervenience is what I say is the evidence for, for physicalism about pain. Now, um, the, the pictures that I've presented so far is, is, is this. Um, understand the upward arrow um, to mean something like the, 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 the thing below the arrow is some evidence for the thing above the arrow. So I'm, I'm claiming that the empirical supervenience of pain's phenomenal character on neural properties is some evidence for physicalism about pain. But what's the evidence for maintaining the empirical supervenience of pain's phenomenal character on neural properties? Um, well, empirical supervenience is um, a universal regularity, as we saw. So the formulation of it, let me just go back. The formulation of it is a universal generalization, a, a negative um, rather than affirmative universal generalization, but a universal generalization. Um, and the evidence for it is um, positive instances of the universal um, generalization. So specific cases where some feature of the phenomenal, some, well, some phenomenal feature of pain um, doesn't change or vary without there being some simultaneous change or variation in um, the, the uh, neural properties of the person feeling um, the pain. Um, in particular, the evidence for the empirical supervenience of pain's phenomenal character um, um, that I have in mind are the results of various um, very interesting experiments um, on uh, pain. Um, details can be found in the notes to one of the papers that I sent to the conference organizer um, beforehand. Um, but le le let me say a little about the general character of these experiments. So these experiments involve experimental subjects who have been trained to introspect their pains more accurately. So they've been trained to introspect their pains while, while they're in pain and to report on their pains. You can be trained to get better at that. Um, now, in the experiments, um, the subjects that are deliberately subjected to pain, the experimental subjects are volunteers, of, of course, um, and the, the pains are, are, uh, are never terrible pains. Um, the subjects are deliberately subjected to pain, and wh while they describe their pains, drawing on their having been trained to report on their pains more accurately, while they describe their pains on the basis of introspection, their brain activity is measured with um, such uh, devices as, as high-resolution uh, functional MRI. So people are introspecting their pains and they're reporting on what their pains are like. They're telling the experimenters what it's like to experience that pain right now. And the experimenters at the same time are um, um, observing what's going on in the, the subject's brains. So let me say a little, <coughs> excuse me, let me say a little about the results. So in one experiment, um, Subjects had pain inflicted on them. I, I don't remember if this is the, the this is the right experiment, but in one of one of these experiments, um, a mild acid is injected under the skin of the patients on their arm or something like that, and 
the intensity of the pain gradually increases over time. Then it decreases, but it has a period of increasing. And as the subjects reported that the intensity of their pain was increasing, the level of activity in their primary somatosensory cortex increased correspondingly. So the, um, the experimentalists could see a change um, in uh, a property of the subject's brains as the subjects were reporting that the felt intensity of, of the pain was, was increasing. Um, in another experiment, um, hypnotic suggestion was used um, to reduce the felt unpleasantness of pain without reducing the felt intensity of the pain. So it turns out that the, the intensity of pain and the unpleasantness of pain are not the same thing, and they can vary. We already knew this. <coughs> they can vary independently of, of one another. Um, some um, pain medications um, lead people to say things like, well, I, can still, I still have the pain, I can still feel it, but it's not bad. It's no longer unpleasant. Right? Anyway, in these experiments, hypnotic suggestion was used to manipulate um, the unpleasantness of pain um, so um, that it went up while the intensity of the pains didn't go up. And the other way around, the intensity went up, but the unpleasantness didn't. Now, um, when the subjects um, reported increased pain intensity without an increase in the felt unpleasantness of the pain, there was increased activity in the subject's primary somatosensory cortex. Um, but not um, in the parts of the brain that constitute um, the, the classical um, limbic system, for example, the anterior cingulate um, cortex. And then when, when um, there was an increase in the um, pleasantness of the pains that the subjects reported, but not an increase in the intensity uh, uh, of, the play, uh, of the pains. Then there, were, there was um, uh, observed um, the opposite thing, an increased activity in the classical limbic cortical areas, but, no, but not in the primary somatosensory cortex. Um, in a, in uh, another e e experiment, when subjects um, felt pains in different bodily locations, so pain in, pain in the arm versus a pain in the foot, say, um, there was increased activity in different subregions of the primary somatosensory cortex. And the felt location of the pain corresponds to particular re subregions of the primary somatosensory cortex. So what the results of these, what these results are, are specific cases where aspects of the phenomenal character of pain ch uh, change. And whenever, but whenever they change, or whenever there's variation in them, there's change or variation in um, a measurable um, state of the subject's brain. Now, alongside that, um, there's the negative result that these experimenters never find um, people reporting changes in the phenomenal character of their pain without the experimental, uh, experimenters also being able to detect changes in their brain state. So what these results um, tend to support is the idea that always, when there's a change or variation in the phenomenal character of pain, there's a change or variation in the neural properties of the subject's, um, subject's brain. Um, these are very striking results. Resu the experiments I'm thinking of were all done a few years um, ago now. I haven't looked into the, um, the literature um, recently. I expect there have been more experiments um, on, the, uh, um, on the same lines, but I haven't, um, I haven't checked um, on that. 
So let me turn now to my third um, section. Um, I want to explain why the empirical supervenience, what I've called why empirical supervenience, as I've called it, um, the fact that um, no change or variation in the phenomenal character of pain ever occurs, in fact, without there also being a simultaneous change in the neural properties of the subject. I want to explain why that counts as evidence for physicalism and why um, physicalism is more probable given on that evidence than dualism is um, on that evidence. So specifically, I'm going to, to answer two questions which um, are here. First question, how exactly does the em empirical supervenience, or the empirical supervenience of the phenomenal character of pain on neural properties, raise the probability of physicalism about pain? And secondly, I'll, I'll answer this question, how exactly does, this ev does empirical supervenience raise the probability of physicalism higher than it raises the probability of, um, of, of, of dualism? Um, in answering, I'm going to use the framework of Bayesian confirmation theory. It's very elegant um, and very neat, but I think the same um, points that I want to be uh, I want to make could also be made if you um, use uh, different frameworks for thinking about confirmation and um, and and evidence. Um, so let me turn to the first um, question first. So here's the, to remind you, here's the question. How exactly does, the empir does empirical supervenience raise the probability of physicalism about pain? Um, well, um, Bayes' theorem, which is... Um, um, the claim that the probability of a hypothesis on evidence is the, the product of the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis times the uh, prior probability of the hypothesis divided by the prior probability of the evidence. Bayes' theorem implies that any logical consequence of a hypothesis raises the probability of the hypothesis um, just so long as two very modest conditions are met, which we can safely assume are met in the case um, at hand. Um, um, and empirical supervenience is a logical consequence of physicalism about pain. So empirical supervenience is a logical consequence of physicalism about pain. Any logical consequence of a hypothesis raises the probability of that hypothesis so long as the prior probability of the hypothesis is not zero and as long as the prior probability of the evidence is not uh, one, is less than one, or between, between zero and one. Um, let me I explain how um, empirical supervenience is a logical consequence of physicalism about pain. Remember, for physicalism about pain to be true, one of two things must hold. Um, either pain must be a physical state or it must be a higher order state that's realized by a physical state. Suppose that pain is a physical state. It's, if it just is a physical state, then obviously it can't happen. We're never going to observe um, change in the character of a pain that's not accompanied by a change in a neural state, because on, on that assumption, um, pain just is a kind of neural um, state. That's, that's straightforward. What's a little less straightforward, but still an, an, true on reflection, is that if pain is a physically realized higher order state, um, we would uh, empirical supervenience is still a consequence of that. Um, and the crucial thing to understand here is that if pain is a higher order state that is physically realized, then the physical state that realizes it is a sufficient condition given the laws of, uh, of the physical laws for the pain. 
because the physical realizer is a sufficient condition given the physical laws for the pain, if there's any change in the pain, then either the physical laws have changed or the physical state has changed. But obviously the physical laws haven't changed, they don't change. So the physical um, realizer must no longer um, um, be there. There must be some different um, physical state in, instead. So if pain is um, a higher order state that's physically realized, it's also the case that we would expect never to observe uh, a change in the phenomenal character of a subject's pain without there being some change in the uh, neural state, um, the physical state of the subject's, the subject's brain. So that's the first question. Let me turn to the, the second question. How exactly does empirical supervenience um, raise the probability of physicalism higher than it raises the probability of, um, of dualism? Um, the operative principle from Bayesian confirmation theory here is the one that I have on, on the screen. Whenever two hypotheses, this is also a consequence of Bayes' theorem, by the way. Um, whenever two hypotheses both entail the same evidence, that's to say um, the probability of the evidence E given H1 equals the probability of E given H2 equals 1, so when they both in, entail the evidence. Bayes' theorem entails that the probability of the first hypothesis on the evidence is greater than the probability of the second hypothesis on the evidence if and only if the prior probability of the hypothesis of the first hypothesis is greater than the prior probability of the second um, uh, hypothesis. So Bayes' theorem um, says, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, that the probability of a hypothesis on the evidence equals the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis times the prior probability of the hypothesis divided by the prior probability of the evidence. Well, when the evidence is the same for two hypotheses, the probability, the prior probability of the evidence is the same for the two hypotheses. When both hypotheses entail the evidence, the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis um, is the same for both hypotheses. Hypotheses, it's one because of the probability of the evidence. Sorry, if a, if a hypothesis entails the evidence, the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis is is one. So the only um, factor left to uh, to vary is the prior probability of um, the hypothesis. So if the prior probability of one of the hypotheses is higher than that of the other. Um, the, uh, the probability of that hypothesis on the evidence is greater than the uh, probability of the other hypothesis um, on, on, on that same evidence. Um, so in the present case, um, I, I claim that both physicalism and dualism entail empirical supervenience. And then I, I, I further claim, and this is the heart of the matter, um, that dualism has a lower prior probability than physicalism. Um, now, I've already explained how physicalism entails um, empirical supervenience. Let me just say a little bit about how dualism does, or at least can, um, entail um, empirical um, supervenience. I mean, this will also show that dualism is consistent with empirical supervenience, as, as I um, mentioned a little while ago. Um, sorry, we seem to have a little technical glitch there, but I think it's, it's fixed. Um, so maybe not every kind of dualism, because dualism can be, it's not one single thesis, it's a family of interrelated theses. Perhaps not every kind of dualism would entail the supervenience, the, the uh, empirical supervenience. In, in, I mean, those um, uh, formulations of dualism might be, 
refuted by empirical supervenience. But there are formulations of dualism that do entail um, empirical supervenience. Um, they just need to incorporate a, um, a, a certain claim. So suppose that somebody is subjected to a noxious stimulus, pain-causing um, stimulus, that's going to cause their brain to go into a certain state. I mean, and dualists must accept that because we, everybody knows that, that that's true. What the, what the dualist can say at that point is that there are fundamental psychophysical laws of nature by which those, that brain state that, is, that you're caused to go into by the fact that you've been subjected to a noxious stimulus causes you to go into a state of pain which is itself not a physical or physically realized state. And then that uh, immaterial state of pain can have further downstream um, consequences. The crucial thing there is that dualism can include the claim um, that certain brain states, certain highly specific brain states, are both uh, are causally sufficient or are, if this is different, nomologically sufficient for being in uh, pains of highly um, specific characters. Um, that means that um, that sort of dualist um, can predict what we actually observe. Um, empirical um, supervenience. Okay. But I'm claiming that empirical supervenience raises the probability of physicalism uh, higher than it raises the probability of dualism. And the reason for that, I said, is that the prior probability of physicalism is higher than the prior probability of dualism. Why is that? Well, I claim that dualism is less parsimonious than physicalism. Because it's less parsimonious, it has a lower prior probability. Um, dualism is less parsimonious than physicalism for two reasons. Um, the first is that dualism is committed to more kinds of state than physicalism is committed to. So, of course, both physicalism and dualism are committed to the existence of brain states, which are physical, and also to pain states. Um, but physicalism doesn't construe pain states as additional to brain, uh, pain states as additional to brain states. It says that pain states either are brain states, uh, pain states either are brain states, or they're realized by um, brain states. Either way, they're not something over and above. Um, brain states. But for dualism, pain states are additional to, they are something over and above, states of the brain, because they're not identical with states of the brain according to dualism, and they're not identical to physically realized higher order states um, according to, to dualism. So dualism is committed to more kinds of state. Dualism is also committed to more fundamental laws than physicalism is, because in order for dualism to predict the empirical supervenience that we observe, it's got to maintain that there are fundamental laws. And these, these can't be physical laws because there aren't any physical laws that connect physical states to st states that are neither physical nor physically realized. Um, dualism is committed to these additional fundamental laws that physicalists are um, not committed to, these fundamental psychophysical laws whereby when a person is in a certain state of their brain, they, that their being in that state is causally or nomologically sufficient for their being in a state of pain that is itself neither physical nor, uh, nor physically realized. Um, now, to complete my argument, I need to say um, something about um, the way that I'm appealing to parsimony here uh, parsimony or economy, sometimes people call it simplicity. Um, um, I'm appealing to th th that as relevant to the prior probability of um, hypotheses. The situation we have is in, a, in effect this. 
physicalism about pain and dualism about pain are empirically equivalent hypotheses with regard to the evidence that I've been talking about, empirical supervenience. So they both entail exactly the same um, claim of empirical um, supervenience, which claim um, seems to be um, true. And in effect, I'm appealing to parsimony as a tiebreaker. Um, it, 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 break, it, it gives the edge to, to physicalism over dualism. And the question, of course, is, is it legitimate to appeal to parsimony to play that tie-breaking role, which in a, in, in, um, in a Bayesian way of thinking about confirmation means assigning a higher prior probability to physicalism than to dualism. Um, I think it is um, legitimate. Let me try to bring it out um, by way of an analogy, which I will, I will get to in, in, in a second, what d dualists about pain are asking us to do is to posit additional uh, links, additional immaterial links, links that are neither physical nor physically realized, in an otherwise entirely physical causal chain. So suppose I'm in my kitchen and I'm cooking and I touch the hot stove by mistake. Uh, thermal nociceptors, specialist nerve cells in my fingers, um, cause me to enter a sequence of brain states, which result, let's say, in my walking to the kitchen sink and holding my finger under a stream of cold water for five ten, or ten minutes, which is supposed to reduce the inflammation um, that res otherwise results from a burn. Now, physicalists say that one of those intermediate brain states, one of those brain states that is um, intermediate between my touching the hot stove and then my deciding to walk over and treat the burn by holding my finger under the cold water, is a, a pain state or realizes um, um, a pain state. Dualists say that none of those intermediate brain states is my pain uh, or realizes my pain. They say that my pain is an immaterial state that is sandwiched between two of those brain states. So some brain state causes the immaterial state, which is neither physical nor physically realized, and any immaterial state, which is neither physical nor physically realized, realized causes a further brain state that results in my walking over to the uh, kitchen uh, tap and uh, running cold water on my uh, injury. But dualists point to nothing in my reaction to pain, which is explained on the supposition that pain is an immaterial state that is not already explained by the supposition that pain is a brain state or is a higher order state realized by um, a, a brain state. So construing my pain as neither physical nor physically realized doesn't give us any additional explanatory power. It doesn't explain my behavior any better. It doesn't explain more of my behavior. It doesn't explain any behavior that would otherwise go um, unexplained. It doesn't even explain my introspective judgments because we can explain those by reference to the brain states as well. Um, what I'm reporting on when I report the intensity of my pain is um, a brain state, which is what seems to be happening, of course, in, these, uh, in the experiments that I was um, describing earlier. Now, what should we say about the... Um, um, conflict here or, the, or the, the contest between physicalism, the physicalist view and the dualist view of what happens when I burn my finger by touching the, the stove. Well, one way to approach it which um, shortcuts um, theoretical discussions about the role of parsimony in, co uh, in, in, in confirmation is to consider an analogous case. Um, a case where um, 
Our feelings are not engaged in the way that they typically are when we're thinking about the mind-body problem and whether, whether we are purely material objects or something, something more than that. So here's an, an analogous case where I say it's perfectly clear what we should think. And then my suggestion is that we should say the same thing in, in the uh, case of physicalism versus dualism. So here's the analogous case, a topical one, sadly. Um, <clears throat> suppose that someone proposes a new hypothesis about how cases of COVID-19 develop in people. So here's the, here's the hypothesis. People inhale particles of the coronavirus. Those particles invade the linings of their lungs. The, when the lungs, linings of the lungs are invaded, that puts patients into an immaterial state. It puts them into a certain state, a physiological state, which is, or you, perhaps you shouldn't call it a physiological state, but it puts them into a state which consists of their lungs now having immaterial properties, properties that are neither uh, physiological nor physiologically realized. And then that immaterial state, that state that's neither physiological nor physiologically realized, then causes massive inflammation. And the um, consequences that, that flow from that. Now, if somebody proposed that hypothesis, we would immediately dismiss it, um, surely. It needlessly injects an immaterial link into an otherwise entirely physical causal chain. And it's not that it's automatically wrong to, to do that. It's that we don't get anything. We don't get any bang for our buck. We get no explanatory gain by doing that. And dualism seems to be in the same situation with regard to the case where I touch the hot stove, that causes me to go through a series of, of brain states, um, which result in my walking over to the kitchen and treating my burnt finger under the running water. Um, the dualist seems to be inserting um, an immaterial state into a, um, a well-established causal chain that is uh, physical or physically realized, and it does so needlessly. It doesn't explain anything that we would not otherwise be able to explain. It doesn't offer a better explanation of something that we were otherwise able to explain, though, in an inferior uh, way. Um, it doesn't even, as I say, it's not even required to explain why we would have the ability to report on, on our pains. Um, well, there's plenty more to say about all of this, but I'm going to um, stop there, and I look forward um, um, now on a Friday afternoon to uh, talking with you in person um, via Zoom in uh, eight days' time. Thank you for your attention.